Hey everyone, I'm Scott Cohen, the School Counseling Director at Indian River High School. This is our college and scholarship application process presentation. We did this the other night, um, but we decided to re-record it uh, just to make it a little bit more time efficient, so we hope you enjoy. Before we get started, just some basic yearbook information. Um, the last day for makeups for the senior formals is October 29th, 2020. Um, you can go to the Indian River High School website and find out more information about how you can get your senior pictures taken. Also, if you want to order a yearbook, uh, they are currently $80, but as you can see, at the end of October, this price is going to go up. There is also some information about if you want to personalize your yearbook and how much extra things cost and when the last day to personalize your yearbook is, which is January 22, 2021. If you have any questions about yearbooks, please email Ms. Linda Finley at lynda.finley at cpschools.com. Our access counselor is Ms. Tasha Saki. We're very fortunate to have her five days a week. Um, she is a great resource to our seniors to specifically help them with colleges and scholarships. You can see all of her contact information is here, including her phone numbers, her email address. She created a Schoology access code just for her access. Um, and she also has uh, Remind Me and um, some other information here as well. So please make sure you write this information down so you can get in touch with Ms. Saki. You can see these are specifically the things that she does, um, working with students, seniors, um, mostly regarding scholarships, the FAFSA, which is the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, which opened October 1st of 2020. Uh, you can contact Ms. Saki to make an appointment, parents or students, and she will be glad to work with you. Um, she is an expert in working with the FAFSA, so specifically if you have any unusual circumstances at home or maybe with your taxes, she can really walk you through the process. She can also assist you with SAT and AC testing, ACT testing information, fee waivers for colleges, and of course um, regarding college applications um, as well. If any of our seniors have younger brothers or sisters at Indian River in 9th through 11th grade, she also works with 9th through 11th graders, so it's not just for seniors. All right, so before we get started, just a couple of reminders. We always want to make sure that our parents and guardians know to check their emails regularly. We need our seniors to check their emails regularly. We're going to be emailing you guys a lot of information throughout the year, and emails are really the best way to get in touch with you. Um, we also need seniors to check their Chesapeake Public School emails regularly. I know a lot of you have personal ones, but we rely on your school-related emails to get information to you. You can also see that Guidance has created a course just for seniors in Schoology, a group regarding scholarships just for seniors at Indian River High School, and then Mrs. Jones, our testing coordinator, who is also one of our counselors, has created an AP testing group and there the access code. So please join if you have not already done so. All right, so to get this process started, I, I use this line a lot um, over the years. I've had a lot of seniors after they've been through the college application process, they're like, oh my gosh, Mr. Cohen, I thought the senior year was supposed to be fun. I never said it was gonna be fun. It can be fun, but it's gonna be a lot of work. So for seniors who are applying for four-year colleges or for scholarships, it is a lot of work and it can be stressful both for the seniors and for the parents. So it's really important that you listen to some of the tips we're going to give you tonight and hopefully it'll make it easier for you seniors and your parents to survive this year. It's important to know who to talk to. These are our school counselors this year. If your last name is A through CR, Mr. Hargrove is your counselor. Last name CU through HAR is Ms. Thompson. HAS through MC is Mrs. Jones. ME through SC is Mrs. Peterson. Ms. Potts is one of our new counselors. She handles the end of the alphabet. And of course, Ms. Saki is our access counselor. Mrs. Jones also works with AP testing and Mr. Hargrove works with scholarships and Ms. Thompson works with dual enrollment. Mrs. Peterson also works with um, college visits and Ms. Potts um, works with our uh, military people. She's our military liaison and she also works with the Chesapeake Career Center. So uh, the counselors have some extra responsibilities, but really seniors, if you're applying for colleges, you want to work with your assigned counselor because he or she will be the best person um, to give you the best advice and direct you on how to do it properly. All right, so parents um, and seniors, we created a video a couple weeks ago in September and we talked to the seniors about 
what their options are after high school. So these are the things you can do after high school seniors. Number one, you can do absolutely nothing and live with your parents the rest of your life, eat their food, um, and just hang out on the sofa watching TV. We do not recommend this for seniors. This is not a good choice for you or your parents. So really it's not an option. We know that some of our seniors will join the military. Some will go into um, full-time work or start their career. Some will go to vocational school, maybe like a welding school or maybe something like ECPI. But a lot of you, roughly two thirds of you are gonna go to a community college like TCC or you'll be going to a four-year college. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about those last two options um, for the rest of the presentation. The difference between a two and four-year college, um, a lot of students aren't really quite sure why would someone go to a two-year college. So let's talk, talk about TCC or a two-year college first. When you go to a community college, you can go part-time, you can go full-time, you can take one class a semester, you can take five or six classes a semester. The application process is really easy. There's no SATs, there's no essay writing, there's no fees. You just go online to tcc.edu and you apply typically in May, June, or July of 2021 if you're graduating this year. Um, so it's really not too complicated. As long as you're graduating from high school, you're eligible, go, eligible to go to community college. Um, you can stay at TCC for a semester, maybe a year, maybe two years. The end goal is one of two things, either you're going to earn your associate's degree at TCC, or you're going to transfer to a four-year college like Norfolk State, UVA, Virginia Tech, Longwood, ODU, one of those four-year colleges. Remember, there are some careers out there that you don't have to go to a four-year college. You may just need a two-year or associate's degree. For example, if you wanted to be a veterinary technician, not a vet, but a vet tech, you don't have to go to a four-year college. You just have to get your associate's degree from a community college. You go for two years, and then you can start your job or your career as a vet tech. So it's very important that you start researching careers that you're interested in and knowing what kind of education you need, whether it's a two-year degree, um, a college degree and getting your bachelor's, or maybe it's some type of specific trade school. For me, there's really three main reasons that a student would start off at community college or TCC. Number one is money. To go to college, it's very expensive, and I have some slides that are going to show you that information. So if there's not a lot of money um, saved up already and you know you don't want to take loans and you're not sure if you're going to win a lot of scholarships, starting off at Tidewater Community College is a great option because it's so affordable. A second reason is a lot of our seniors are like, you know, Mr. Cohen, I do get well in high school, but I'm not sure that I really want to devote four years to college and all that studying and writing papers and reading. So if you're not really sure about it, don't spend a lot of money going to college for that first year when you can just start off at community college and take the exact same classes that will eventually transfer to your four year college of your dreams. And then finally, a lot of our seniors will say, you know, Mr. Cohen, I goofed off in ninth and 10th grade. I made some C's, some D's, even some E's. With my GPA being what it is, now that I'm a senior, there's no way I'm gonna get into the colleges I wanna to go to. If you go to community college first and spend a year or two there, those four-year colleges will look heavily on your TCC grades and not your high school grades. So this is a way for you to kind of almost do a do-over or a start-over, and you can really show four-year colleges what you're made of by going to Tidewater Community College and getting really good grades in a year or two's worth of classes at the community college. Now, if you're interested in going to TCC, we are fortunate to have Mrs. Estelli. She doesn't work at Indian River, but she is assigned to Indian River. She works at the Chesapeake campus of TCC, and she is your best contact person. So if you're a senior and you're interested in going to Tidewater Community College after high school, after you graduate, you can contact Ms. Destelli. You can see that her email is there, hdestelli at tcc.edu, and her phone number is there. She is going to be your best information source. You can also see some of the things that she can help you with, the admissions process, scholarship opportunities, financial aid, all different kinds of things at TCC. And you can even see that she is going to be setting up some information sessions um, with their dates and times. So if you're interested, you can either email her or call her, or you can go to the website in green. Um, you can just copy that down and you will be able to register for any of those information sessions. 
Now, a four-year college, which is where we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about today, is totally different. A four-year college, you are committed to the process. You are saying, I'm willing to go to college for four, maybe five years, and I'm going to earn my bachelor's degree. When you get a bachelor's degree, it could be a bachelor's degree of science, or maybe it could be a bachelor's of arts, but you're going to major in something specific like biology or drama or mathematics or chemistry. Um, this four-year bachelor's college degree is going to either prepare you for graduate school or it's going to help you have a better chance of getting a better paying job. By going to college and getting your college degree, it is going to help you be a more critical thinker, a more critical writer, a, be a better public speaker, and you're going to be learning from all different kinds of students and professors um, that are also trying to better themselves and educate themselves. A four-year college degree doesn't necessarily um, help you get a specific job, but it better prepares you for the workforce in certain types of careers. And if you want to go to graduate school to be a doctor or you want to be a lawyer or you want to be a high school counselor, you have to get a master's degree or a doctorate, which means you have to go to college first. So again, when you go to a four-year college and we're talking about Florida State, Norfolk State, um, Hampton University, Radford University, those are all four-year colleges, you're going to take about five classes per semester or roughly 10 classes per year for four years. So you're going to take about 40 classes. Out of those 40 classes, maybe 10 to 15 are going to be in your major, and we talked about that, maybe biology, maybe chemistry, religion, philosophy, anthropology, whatever. And then you're going to have about 10 classes that are general ed requirements, classes that everybody has to take. And then the other classes are just going to be electives. So you will have some opportunities to take classes um, outside of your major and outside of the gen ed requirements. Now, to apply to a four-year college, it's going to involve some more heavy-duty steps, unlike going to TCC. So the first thing you need to do is you need to figure out where it is you want to apply to college. And the easiest way I can tell you to think about this is if I told everybody that I was going to give every senior a brand new car. Every senior would be excited, but every senior would be looking for different features for what they wanted in a brand new car. One person may want a convertible, one person may want a truck, one person may say, I want a red car, one person wants a sunroof, um, or someone may say, look, just give me a car that gets me from point A to point B that has good air conditioning and that's all that I want. So think about colleges that way. Every college has different features and you need to think about what features are you looking for. So let's talk about some of those features. First of all, how close do you want to be to home? Do you want to be 15 minutes away and go to ODU or Norfolk State? I mean, that means you could potentially run into your parents when you're going out to dinner or you go to the mall. Um, is that okay with you? Do you want to be a little bit further away, maybe like an hour away where you can still come home on the weekends and do your laundry and come back to homecoming and that type of thing? Or do you want to be a couple hours away where you're kind of really doing this on your own and you're maybe only going to come back once or twice per semester? Or do you want to go out of state? Do you want to go to Hawaii? Do you want to go to Alaska for college? Do you want to go up to New York for college? How close to home do you want to be? You need to think about the cost. Colleges in Virginia are going to be a lot cheaper than colleges outside of Virginia because you're paying Virginia taxes, um, so they're going to be a little bit more affordable. Size of classes. Do you want your college classes to be the same size as they are in high school, or are you okay with a psychology class your freshman year being 500 students in an auditorium and all the professor does is just lecture to you? If that freaks you out, don't go to schools like UVA or Virginia Tech because you're going to have those huge classes at those schools. Now, you're going to have smaller classes as well, but you can't guarantee they're always going to be small. You need to think about what majors you're interested in. If you say that you want to be a political science major because maybe you want to get into politics, then maybe you should go to a college that's close to a major city like Richmond or D.C. so you can be near where the action is. You also need to think about, do you want to go to college in a big town or a big city? Do you want to go somewhere where it's really, really small and the only thing that's there is the college? Do you want to go to a college that has, has all different kinds of clubs and sports and they have a football team or they don't have a football team? Um, and you need to think about the, the bizarre things that I call bizarre. What if you go to a college and you go visit the college and you see that the dorm you're going to be living in your freshman year Right next door, they are building a new cafeteria. Well, that's exciting, 
But if they're going to be building that cafeteria right next to your dorm where you're sleeping and studying every single day your freshman year, that could be a little bit annoying. So you need to really research the colleges and find out where you'd be living. What's the dorm like? What's the cafeteria like? All those types of things. We talked about money and costs, and this was just from a quick research about a week or two ago. To go to TCC and take five classes per semester, it's going to cost you roughly $2,700 per semester or about $5,500 per year. So that's everything. Now that's with you living at home and eating your parents' food, but that's going to cover all of your costs to take um, those 10 classes during the whole school year. If you go to a Virginia public school, like some of the ones listed here, and live in the dorms and eat their food, you can see that that ten thousand or that five fifty five hundred dollars now goes up to twenty three thousand, twenty thousand, twenty six thousand. It's much more expensive to go to a four year college, and these are the public schools in Virginia. If you choose to go to a private school in Virginia, you can see the cost is even more. However, all of these colleges and universities will give you a lot of financial aid to make it more affordable. So the reason I put this up here is don't freak out if you see a really high price tag for a Virginia private school because they are going to give you some financial aid that will make it more comparable to the 20000 range that we saw on the earlier slide. Um, do know that if you go out of state, even to public schools in North Carolina or Maryland or Florida, those colleges are going to be more expensive for you because you're an out-of-state student and you're not paying those state taxes. So their tuition and their dorms and their uh, food are going to be more comparable to the prices that you see on this slide right here. Other factors to think about, you know, internships and work opportunities. You know, if you're interested in maybe studying marine biology and you want to work with a marine biologist, it probably makes sense to go to college somewhere that there's a river close by or lakes or oceans or something, maybe not a landlocked area. You also want to check things out like the four-year graduation rate. If you research a college and they say that 90% of their students graduate in four years, that's amazing. That means the majority of the students are graduating on time. If you see that the graduation rate is 42%, that's not so good. That means less than half of the students who start their freshman year are not graduating in four years, and that could be a little bit of a concern. You also want to make sure, do you have the academic requirements to get accepted to the college you're applying to? Um, we have a lot of students that say, oh, I'm going to apply to Yale and Harvard and not MIT, but are you being realistic about whether or not you can get in there? Because when you're applying to those Ivy League schools, you're competing against the best of the best around the world. So just be realistic and open-minded. You're welcome to apply, but I don't want you to be disappointed if you have a 4.2 GPA and you're the president of every club and you're on two varsity sports and you don't get in. It doesn't mean that they don't want you. It just means there's more qualified people out there. And again, if you get into Harvard, it's going to cost you $70,000 per year. Yes, you'll get some financial aid, but it's still going to be very expensive. Is that really worth all of that money, especially if you're maybe thinking about going to graduate school? Are you going to be successful at that college? You know, a lot of students say, I want to go to the hardest college, you know, because that's the best name I've heard of. But when you get there, is that really the best environment for you? You have to decide. And then finally, what are the academic requirements to graduate from that college? Every college is like its own kingdom and they have their own rules and regulations. The one example I use a lot is foreign language. Some colleges require that you take a foreign language to graduate, some do not. So if you're in high school and you did not like Spanish one, two, and three, and you wanna to go to college, but you don't wanna take any more Spanish, you need to research that because I would hate for you to go to a four-year college and then learn your second year that you're going to have to start over and take four years of Spanish um, or, or four semesters of Spanish. So you need to do that research. The best ways to focus your list. First of all, just talk to adults, talk to counselors, teachers, coaches, club sponsors, people at your church or wherever you uh, practice your religion. Um, talk to employers and just say, where did you go to college? What did you like about your college? What didn't you like? If you could do it differently, what would you do differently? Um, and they will give you a lot of really helpful information. 
Also, if you can, go visit the colleges and take a tour, attend the classes, eat in the cafeteria. Now, I know with COVID that may not be realistic or an option, but they probably have a lot of virtual tours on their websites, so you can maybe take a virtual tour and just get a really good idea of what the college atmosphere is like. Um, Mrs. Peterson, as I said earlier, is one of our counselors, and she organizes college reps from their admissions offices to do Zoom meetings with us. So just check the Guidance Schoology course, and there is a uh, folder that says College Visits. You can register for college visits through Zoom, either um, those that the colleges have set up themselves, or sometimes the colleges have said, hey, we specifically wanna do one with, one with Indian River students. So you can see all of those um, listed, and I'll show you a slide in just a second. And then also just go to the college websites, read up on the colleges and see what they talk about themselves, see what's important to them. And you, know, you can usually find out what are the graduation requirements? What do I have to do to apply? You know, all that type of stuff. And then finally, there is a website right here, bigfuture.collegeboard.org, through the College Board, and they will also kind of assist you with um, trying to narrow down your search for colleges. This is the red folder I was talking about that we have in our Schoology course for guidance. It says College Visits and Information Sessions, and you can see that Mrs. Peterson has already put a lot of good information in here. Some of these are for students around the country, and some may specifically be just for Indian River High School students. Um, but please check this probably once a week, and then make sure you register if you need to or join in when it's time to join in. Our goal for you is by late October, you've narrowed your search down to three to five colleges. And why three to five colleges? If you apply to 10 to 15 different colleges, that means you are gonna spend a lot of time applying to colleges and writing essays and filling out all the paperwork. You're also gonna have to pay a college application fee for every single college. So if you apply to 10 colleges and the application fee is 50 bucks per college, that's $500 you're gonna have to pay. And remember, there's only one of you. So if you get accepted to all 10 colleges, you can only go to one. So you might as well narrow it down now. So I suggest three to five colleges. One can be your dream school that you think maybe you have a pretty good chance of getting into. You're not really sure. Um, one college should always be your backup, no meaning, meaning no matter what, you know you're gonna get accepted to that college. Um, and that could be TCC for a lot of students. And then your other two to three colleges should be colleges that you've researched, you feel good about, you're interested in going there, you feel like you have the academic background to get accepted, and that you apply to them. Um, what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to be that student that has a 3.75 GPA and you only apply to Virginia Tech, JMU, UVA, and William & Mary. There is no guarantee you're gonna get into any of those schools, so you always need a backup school. All right, step two is you're gonna to need to get recommendations from teachers or counselors. Um, so we're gonna give you a little bit of advice about how to do that. The first thing we need you to do is we need you to create a resume. And there's a sample resume located in the Schoology course for guidance. Um, and I'll show you that at the very end of the presentation. A resume, this is your chance to brag about yourself in a professional way. You want to let people know specifically what you've been involved with while you've been in high school, both in the school and outside of the school. Um, but do not misrepresent yourself. You know, if you helped out with a canned food drive, that's great. And be specific. Tell us what did you do with the canned food drive? But don't exaggerate it to the point where you're telling things that are not 100% true. But this is your opportunity to really, really talk about yourself. Then you're going to need to ask your teachers, counselors, sp sponsors, or coaches who is willing to write a recommendation for you? You need to think about who are the two or three people who know you well that can write a recommendation. I would recommend a teacher that can talk about what you're like in the classroom, a coach or a sponsor that can talk about what you're like on the football field or in the key club meetings, um, and then maybe a counselor or somebody else that can just kind of wrap it all up and write a different perspective. Um, but remember, you may know us well, but don't assume that we know you that well. So that's why we want you to ask us. That's why we want you to give us a resume. Um, and it's okay if we say no. Sometimes people have asked me to write recommendations and I'll say, you know what? I don't really think I know you that well. And I don't think my recommendation is really gonna help your cause. Is there somebody else that knows you a little bit better? Um, because your recommendation should be very specific. That's why we say who knows you well you want the recommendation to enhance your application. 
When you ask someone for a recommendation, please give them a two week turnaround time. Um, let them know what they're supposed to do when the recommendation is done. Um, if they let you read the recommendation, um, please proofread it. Make sure that we didn't make any grammatical mistakes or we didn't misrepresent you. Or if you wanted us to elaborate something and we didn't, let us know. Some teachers do not give the students the recommendations for them to read, but some do. If they don't, it's perfectly fine. You just have to trust that they wrote a good one. Um, when you apply for colleges, there's going to be a question that's going to say, do you waive the right to see your recommendations? My suggestion is you should always waive the right. What they're saying is, teachers have written recommendations about you. Are you cool that we review your application and you're not going to be able to see what the teachers wrote? You just have to trust that the teachers or the coaches or the sponsors wrote good things about you. If you don't waive your recommendation or your rights to, to see them, it could be a little bit of a red flag that you don't trust the recommender or that you're worried they're going to say something bad about yourself. Um, so I always just say just waive it because you just have to trust us that we're going to write good ones. If you don't want to waive it, that's perfectly fine. You can request to read your recommendations um, that people have submitted for you. I just don't think that's necessary. Um, again, if a teacher says no, don't take it personally. It just means they don't have a lot to say about you that's going to help the cause. And then always remember, please write a thank you note. We appreciate thank you notes. Um, as educators, we love to, you know, just kind of get a shout out for taking time to help you out. So please make sure you do that. All right, so I've given some uh, in-services to teachers before, so I just want to share this for you. When I say get people who know you well, you want people who are going to write very specific things about you. So while these two sentences are nice, it's just not really specific. It just kind of just gives me general information about the student. Whereas if you look at this information, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, it really talks about an, a specific example of how the student was a leader, how the student helped their fellow classmates, and how that student may be seen as someone who's exceptional. So you're looking for teachers, coaches, counselors, sponsors who can write specific things about you and give at least one example of what they're talking about. I also suggest that when you get someone to write a recommendation for you, have a conversation with them prior to them writing the recommendation. Tell them what you're looking for them to say. Tell them about things that they may not know about you or tell them about things that maybe you had blips in your record and you need them to identify that maybe during your sophomore year, your grades weren't as good as they should have been because that's the year your grandmother passed away and you were super close to your grandmother. Um, make sure this person is not gonna just rewrite your resume. That's a very boring recommendation. It's boring for college admissions officers to read. Um, so just remind them not to do that. And colleges want to see, or scholarship people want to see, how do you fit into the Indian River High School community? What is it about you that makes you special in our community? Because they don't want to compare you to someone that goes to Western Branch High School or Tallwood High School or Buckingham High School in the other part of the state. They want to know how do you stand out at Indian River High School? And also, as I mentioned before, let the person know if there are unusual circumstances that you've overcome that you wanna make sure are identified in the recommendation. And think about it this way, the recommendation gives teachers the ability to write things about you that are not already in your college application. All right, step three, we need, I need everybody to read the entire application. It's very important that you read and understand all the deadlines, all the requirements, all the do's and don'ts of what you should be doing for every single college. Every college is like its own kingdom, and there is no way possible that the counselor can know all the ins and outs of every single college. So it's up to you to read and let us know and let your parents know and let you know what you have to do and make sure you complete the application on time. Um, as I said before, read the whole thing first. Know what you're getting yourself into. Know when the deadlines are. Buy a calendar or put it on your phone when the deadlines are and then know what you have to complete and know what the counselor has to complete and maybe your parents have to complete. And we'll talk about JMU and Virginia Tech in just a second. And also know the college's process of how to turn things in. Every college is a little bit different, so it's up to you to be the expert. So just to give you an example, back in September, I did the quick little search of Virginia Tech and you can see I highlighted some information. This is right on their website. I just Googled 
um, freshman admissions requirements for Virginia Tech, and you can see number five, SAT scores. Virginia Tech is a test optional for the 2021 school year. If you would like for your scores to be reviewed, then you have to select that on your application. So if you have SAT or ACT scores that you want them to look at, you need to mark that on your application. Look at number six. Letters of recommendation are not a part of the Virginia Tech application and will not be considered. So guess what? If you send them a letter of recommendation, they're already going to say that you couldn't follow directions because you didn't read this line. Don't send them if they don't want to read them. Number seven, complete the Virginia Tech General Scholarship application by January 22nd. So let's say you're a 4.4 GPA student and you've applied to Virginia Tech and in March you're like, hey, I hear about all these people that are getting Virginia Tech scholarships. How do I apply? You already missed the deadline because you didn't read the application. And then finally, they say they want the free application for federal student aid filled out no later than March 1st. So again, it's spelled out specifically what Virginia Tech wants you to do. Now let's look at JMU. JMU says under optional items, a letter of recommendation is optional and that they want one, but that JMU will contact the recommender with instructions for submitting a letter. So they don't want you to send them the letter. They probably just want the counselor or teacher's email address and they're going to send them information and they're going to get it electronically. They also say, hey, we want a personal statement if you want, their, if you want them to know something about you and it needs to be 500 words or less, and then, or less. And then finally, standardized tests. JMU is no longer requiring the SAT or ACT, um, but it says if you do want to send them a score, it has to come directly from the college board or the ACT people. So in other words, if you have an SAT score and you think, oh, well, the SAT is on my transcript, my score is on my transcript, I'm good to go because I'm going to send my transcript, no, JMU says they need the score to come directly from the College Board or the ACT people. All right, we talked about essays um, a little bit, so I want to go over that for a few minutes. Um, essays are a way for colleges to see what kind of a writer you are, but also how you think, how you express yourself, but also essays give you the opportunity to talk about something that's not already in your college application or resume that you want them to know. So here are just some of the you know, standard essays that you may see. What is your favorite word? You look out your window, what do you see? So you can see they're very open-ended. Um, and I'm gonna give you some tips on how to answer these questions. All right, the personal statement we talked about in JMU was one that said you can do a personal statement and that throws a lot of students off because they're like, oh my gosh, they're not really asking for a question or an answer. What is a personal statement? A personal statement is your opportunity to write about anything that you want to that you want the admissions counselor to know. Um, this is an opportunity for you to identify blips in your record. Um, maybe you got a D in chemistry and you want them to know why you got a D. Um, maybe you didn't play varsity volleyball your sophomore year. You want them to know why you didn't play varsity volleyball. Um, you can talk about your career goals while you're picking that college make the personal statement worthwhile. Don't just write something down because if you put something down, it's probably gonna be boring, which means it's gonna be boring to read, which is not gonna help your cause. Don't make your essay controversial or uninteresting. If there's a possibility that you're gonna offend someone, that could be a problem for you. I also wanna address the issue of writing about COVID-19. You know, we're all going through this crazy time right now, but I feel like there's gonna be a thousands of seniors across the country that are going to write about how COVID-19 shut their school down and that how they had to learn from home and online and how hard it was. While that may be important to you, I feel like a lot of admissions counselors are going to read the exact same essay over and over and over again. So unless you have something very um, distinct to say about this topic, I would maybe not encourage my son to write about it because I just feel like everybody else is going to write about it, but it's up to you. Remember, when you're writing an essay, how long is it allowed to be? If it says, like JMU, I think said no more than 500 words, if you write an amazing 2,000 word essay, you've already not followed the directions. That's not going to help your cause. Um, before you write any essay, I highly suggest you brainstorm with someone first, talk about what you're thinking about writing, get them to give you some ideas, then write it. 
Um, nothing is worse for me, or I feel really bad when a student comes in on a Monday morning and says, oh my gosh, Mr. Cohen, I spent eight hours this weekend working on this essay. What do you think? And I read it and I'm like, it doesn't even make any sense. I don't even know what you're talking about, but they spent so much time on it, but they never really talked to someone about it before they started writing. Once you brainstorm, write a rough draft and get some feedback before you really dig into the final draft. Um, I don't know if you guys use thesauruses anymore. Um, don't use a thesaurus. Use your own vocabulary. It's very apparent when someone just pulls a random word off Google or a thesaurus. It sounds weird and we know exactly where you got it from. After you have written the rough draft, ask yourself, did you answer the question? Was it interesting? Did you make any grammatical mistakes? How does it make you sound? Um, is there a way you can clean it up or make you sound better? And again, did you possibly offend someone in your essay? And I know people are like, do people really write essays that offend? I've read, I've read essays before that definitely were offensive, so don't do it. Um, or if that's your intention, go for it, but be mindful that you may be offending someone not in a good way. So once you've um, looked at the rough draft, you've gotten some feedback, then you're gonna write the final essay, um, and that will be what you'll be using for colleges and scholarships. So I have some friends that are admissions officers in different colleges, and this was one I'm from a pretty competitive college, and these were tips that they gave me a couple years ago that they wanted me to share with students. Number one, when you write an essay, make sure that you're showing what you're talking about instead of just telling. They want you to give specific examples, show them what you're talking about. Um, it's very important. Also, they like to see that you're writing about how you make yourself stand out in the Indian River community or how you stand out, or maybe how you're different than all the other students, but don't make it sound like you're better than anyone. That is not gonna help your cause. Try to use reflective and thoughtful language, use lots of action verbs, and make sure your ending is reflective and thoughtful. Just don't end it, like wrap it up somehow. Having a teacher just check it for grammar mistakes is not enough. Someone needs to give you critical feedback about all the things listed here. Um, I highly recommend that you don't use your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your favorite aunt or your grandmother to be the only person who critiques your essay because they always may not be as completely honest as maybe a teacher or a counselor. You're welcome to send your essay to me um, and I will definitely give you some constructive feedback on it. And then finally, why are you writing about this topic? If you, this is the one thing that you're choosing to write about, make sure that it's important to write about it and make sure that it oozes with a message that is very clear and tells uh, the counselor something about you uh, or the admissions officer something about you that they wouldn't already know. So uh, make it worthwhile, I guess is what I'm saying. You can use your essays over and over uh, just make sure you change the vital information. So what do I mean by that? If you write an essay and you end it by saying, I've always wanted to go to Virginia Union. Virginia Union is my number one school. It's my dream school. Please accept me. And then you decide to use the same essay for William and Mary. If you write to William and Mary in your essay, Virginia Union is my dream school. I've always dreamed of going to Virginia Union. Virginia Union is my number one school. It's apparent that you messed up. So you need to make sure that you are changing the names and the dates and you know all that important information when you're using essays over and over again. Uh, I did wanna mention that when you're applying to colleges, some colleges will use the common application or the coalition application. All it means is you're using the same application and different colleges will accept that application. So if you're applying to two or three different schools that all use the common app, for example, you just have to do the application one time, but maybe write some different essays. Um, I just wanted you to be aware of it. For the common application, you are gonna need the email addresses for your counselor and for any teachers who are writing recommendations for you. Here are some, or here are the common application questions for 2020. It's the same essays they've been using um, for the past couple years. And again, you can see they're very, very thoughtful questions. Um, describe a topic, idea, or concept you find so engaging that it makes you lose all track of time. Why does it captivate you? What or who do you turn to when you want to learn more? Um, these are tough questions. I mean, they're very thoughtful, so you want to make sure you give it plenty of time. And I do want to say that when you're writing essays, remember, you can use these essays over and over again when you're applying to scholarships. So you can use the exact same essays um, when you're applying to scholarships. You just have to tweak them just a little bit. 
All right, step four, and this is a really important one. When you apply to colleges, you have to send your transcript to the college, typically right after you apply, and then mid-year once final grades have been submitted and they're on your transcript in February. So the only way to do this 99.9% um, .9 of the time is through parchment. So if you've not created a parchment account, you need to create a parchment account. We've given you directions in the Schoology course for guidance for Indian River High School, or you can go to the Indian River High School website under Academics and Guidance, and you will see the directions on how to create a parchment account. This is a free account. All Chesapeake students use it. Please make sure you follow our directions. We've had students that have put the wrong graduation year. They've spelled their names wrong. They've just put mistakes that have caused delays in them getting their transcripts. Um, and this is the account you're going to use for the rest of your life when you ever need a transcript. So 10 years from now, if you need a transcript because you're applying to grad school, or you're applying for a job, you're going to go through parchment. So please use an email account that you're going to have the rest of your life. Um, you know, in seventh grade, if you created an email account that said sexymama72 at hotmail.com, it may be time to get a new email address that sounds a little bit more professional. Um, don't use your school email address because that's going to go away after you graduate. So you want to use a personal email account that you will have for the rest of your life and not your parents email account. Do not oversend transcripts to college. I know we have a lot of students that will send it to ODU and then the next day they'll send another one to ODU and then the next day another one to ODU. They don't like that. They just want you to send it one time and they want you to send or request your transcript to be sent after you've already submitted your application. So when you hit submit to the Norfolk State application online, the next day, that's when you request your transcript be sent to Norfolk State. It doesn't cost you any money, it's all free, um, but we do ask for a 14 turnaround day time just to make sure we have plenty of time to release your transcript either to you or to the colleges. Um, as of October 7th of 2020, we have rerun the class ranks and GPAs and uploaded them into parchment. So if you request a transcript be sent to yourself or to your parents or to a college, it has your new GPA and your class rank listed. All right, so this is the question we got a lot of questions about um, in our presentation the other night, SAT and ACT, ACT testing. So I'm gonna be really brief and to the point. Most colleges, and it seems like almost all colleges in Virginia at least, are saying they're not requiring any test scores. No ACT is required, no SAT is required. However, it is up to you seniors to do your investigative research to figure out if that's true. We cannot say 100% that every college is not requiring it, so you need to do your research. Chesapeake is not offering the SAT or ACT during semester one, so we're not even offering it. So if you find that a college is requiring the SAT or ACT, it's going to be up to you to call around locally um, to Virginia Beach, Norfolk, maybe Currituck County in North Carolina, or to the private schools, Greenbrier Christian, Atlantic Shores, to see who is giving the ACT or SAT. And once you find a school that's giving it, then you would just go to the website um, for collegeboard.com or act.org. I think it's collegeboard.org. Um, and then you would just register for that test. Uh, what colleges are telling us is you are not going to be penalized for not having an SAT or ACT score. So um, if you haven't taken the test, I don't think you need to worry about it as long as the college says that you don't need to worry about it. If you want to use a fee waiver for college applications, remember how I talked about every college has like a $50 uh, application for the fee, uh, fee, fee for the application? If you want to get some of those for free, and you would qualify for that if you get free or reduced lunch, or maybe your family's having some financial issues, the only way you can get college application fee waivers is you have to use a fee waiver to take the SAT or ACT. And I know you're saying, wait a second, Mr. Cohen, you just told me I don't have to take the SAT or ACT or the Chesapeake's not even offering it. What I'm saying is you have to use a test fee waiver to register for the test 
you don't actually have to take the test. You just have to use the fee waiver to register. So you could register for the SAT in Wyoming in November, use a fee waiver. You don't actually show up, obviously, in Wyoming in November. But once you've used the fee waiver for the test, um, you will get five college application waivers. And your school counselor or Ms. Saki can assist you with that if you're trying to get any waivers. I hope that was clear. All right, just general information. We do not mail anything for you. Um, colleges, everything's online anyway, but we're never gonna mail scholarship information for you. We need you to do that on your own. All right, step six, since I mentioned scholarships, let's talk about that. Um, Mr. Hargrove is our scholarship coordinator. He's one of our school counselors. How do we advertise scholarships? You can see here, we advertise it really a couple different ways. One, just go to the Indian River High School website and go to guidance and our academics, then guidance and scholarships. Or you can join the Schoology group that Mr. Hargrove has established for Indian River High School seniors. Or you can go to Chesapeake Public School website or the Indian River High School website, and there should be a tab that says Scholarship View. Scholarship View is the Chesapeake Scholarship Engine Search. So any scholarship that we're made aware of through Chesapeake is going to be updated in Scholarship View. Parents and students can access this, this information. When you click on Scholarship View, it'll tell you what to use. I think it's your student ID numbers, your username, um, and your password. I think it's just a generic password, but it'll tell you exactly what to use. So um, it should not be a problem for you to log on. All right, so let's talk about scholarship, the good, and the scholarships, the good and the bad. So the first thing is who wins scholarships? In my opinion, the people who win scholarships are people who excel in one or more of the following areas, academics, athletics, extracurricular activities, community service, or leadership roles. So you really need to be doing one or more of those things and you need to excel. If you're not doing any of those, it's gonna be hard for you to win a scholarship. Do not ever pay for a scholarship application, in my opinion. Um, we got a uh, scholarship the other day that said every senior would have to pay five bucks to apply for it. And I wrote the coordinator and said, hey, you know, what's the five bucks for? And she really couldn't give me a clear answer. So we're not going to advertise that. Um, also, in my opinion, do not ever pay anyone to do scholarship searches for you. So some of you may get these letters in the mail that say, hey, come to our free seminar and we'll guarantee that you will win scholarships if you're willing to pay the $100 fee after the seminar is over. Don't do it. It's complicated. It's, it's a lot of work. You shouldn't be paying for people to do scholarship searches for, like that, for, for you like that. Um, apply for as many scholarships as you can. If you don't apply, you're definitely not going to win. Remember how I talked about writing essays? You can reuse those essays over and over again. And I know, yes, it takes a long time to write essays, but think of it this way. If there's a $500 scholarship and it takes you two hours to write an essay and you win the scholarship, then you basically made $250 an hour. And where else legally can you earn $250 an hour? So I'm just saying it's worth your time. Don't dis get discouraged if you don't win. Um, we have a lot of seniors that apply for lots of scholarships. You're competing against the best of the best. So this, this scenario comes up quite a bit. Hey, Mr. Cohen, you know, I have a 3.7 GPA. I'm on the field hockey team and I am the secretary of the drama club and I didn't win a single scholarship. I'm a nice person and I'm a good student. What happened? It doesn't mean that scholarship people don't like you. It just means that maybe the person they gave it to has a 3.85 GPA, is on two varsity sports teams, and is the captain of one of them, and is the president of the key club. It just means they have more stuff on their resume, which makes them more qualified. So again, you have to excel at stuff. You can't just be good or nice. Um, because it's important that you show them that you're the best person for that scholarship. You need to focus on how you stand out while you're the best applicant. Um, and make sure that you're checking scholarship and the guidance tab and um, the Schoology page so you know what scholarships are out there. Don't miss the deadlines. And do be aware that most of the applications for a lot of the scholarships we know about aren't going to be available till January or February or March or April of 2021. So there's not a lot out there right now. So don't be discouraged if you don't see a lot. 
These are some of the scholarships that go just to Indian River High School seniors. So you can see um, we have lots of great ones. And I got to talk about some of these. We have some scholarships that certain students just don't take the time to apply to. And I'll say, for example, last year, Jay Farrow, who um, is, was on Saturday Night Live, had a show on Showtime, was a 2005 Indian River grad, gives away a $5,000 scholarship every year to a senior who is going to graduate and go to college to study in the fine arts. And some years we have zero applicants, even though people we know are going to major in art or major in theater or major in something that's close to the fine arts, they don't take the time to do it. Um, so make sure you're applying for all these scholarships and don't think, well, I'm not really what they're looking for, so I shouldn't apply. If you're the only one that applies, sometimes you may win just because you're the only one that applied. Um, also, I want to mention, I think I have it up here, the PTSA. Um, make sure that you're joining the PTSA when that becomes available, because for the PTSA scholarship, you have to be a member to be able to apply for the scholarship. For scholarships, make sure you follow their directions. Make sure you're aware of the deadlines. Do not spend money on those fancy folders to put your resume and your application in fancy folders unless they ask for it. Because what we hear from scholarship people is when you put your application in a fancy folder, the first thing that they do is rip it out of the fancy folder and throw the fancy folder away. So don't spend your money on all that stuff if you don't need to. Um, and of course, we also talked about the PTSA and the other dues. Um, if you're in any clubs, just make sure you always have paid up all of your dues. These are two legitimate websites, the Lincoln Lane Foundation. Um, this is a no brainer. Um, they are very generous to Chesapeake and Hampton Road public school students. If you are going to, sorry, if you are going to a four year college and you have a 3.0 GPA or higher um, and you have financial need, financial need, definitely go to the Lincoln Lane Foundation website. Um, if you are granted a scholarship from them, it's going to be two to four thousand dollars per year. So and that's for four years. So that could be eight to sixteen thousand dollars. And they're very, very generous. But you have to follow their directions. You have to get the application in by November 15th. You have to go to their website. You have to follow all of their directions. Um, another legitimate college search. I mean, I'm sorry, scholarship search website is fastweb.org. If you go to fastweb.org, um, you're going to ask, be asked to answer about 20 different questions. You or your parent, your parents can do this as well. And then when you log on to FastWeb, it will give you scholarships that you're eligible for. Now, remember, this is a, you know, global website. So you're going to be competing against other people from around the country or around the world. Um, so it's going to be a lot more competitive, but people win scholarships. So you just have to check it out. Do be aware that when you log on to fastweb.org the second time, the first thing that's going to pop up is, hey, do you want to order People magazine for $19.99 and get, you know, 10 uh, versions of this or 10 editions of this magazine? Just click no, and then it takes you right to the information you need. That's just a little way they make money, but you don't have to pay anything. You don't have to buy anything. Um, just say no, you're not interested. All right, so the financial aid process. We talked about scholarships. Scholarships um, is money that people are gonna give you for being really cool or really outstanding or excelling in one of the areas. Um, but financial aid is money that the government or the colleges are gonna give you. And most of that money is either gonna be grants or scholarships that you don't have to pay back. A loan through financial aid is money you do have to pay back. And in order to be eligible for any of these special loans or grants or scholarships from the federal government or from different colleges, you have to complete the free application for federal student aid, which opened up October 1st, 2020 for this for seniors going to college next year. Um, you can do this yourself or just make an appointment with Ms. Saki. She's super helpful. She knows all the ins and outs and she will help you out make sure that you're aware of all the deadlines that are involved with your colleges and with FAFSA. You're gonna have to submit probably your 2019 tax return because nobody's really done their 2020 tax return. Um, and you're gonna have to list on your FAFSA what colleges you're applying to. After about two weeks, um, once you've submitted your FAFSA, you will hear from the federal government 
what kind of money you qualify for, either money you don't have to pay back or money you do have to pay back. And then once you're accepted to the colleges, you're going to receive a financial aid package from them letting you know what money you receive from the colleges that you don't have to pay back. All right, so two quick things. We already talked about who wins scholarships. You know, you have to excel in one of those five areas. But I do want to go over just the quick two-minute version of the FAFSA and the free application of the um, financial aid process. So I think I kind of explained it, but I just want to wrap it all up. In order for you to get financial aid, loans, grants, or scholarships from the federal government or from different colleges, you have to do the FAFSA. When you complete the FAFSA, you're entering all of your information about you and your parents and how much money everybody makes and how much money you have saved up. When you do the FAFSA, you're going to list the colleges that you're applying to. When Ms. Saki or you submit your FAFSA, after about two weeks, the government is going to respond to you and say, based on your FAFSA, this is what you qualify for financially. Then, once you apply to colleges and you're accepted to colleges, the colleges, about two or three weeks after you're accepted, will send you a financial aid package listing specifically what extra money you're going to be awarded. And then what I suggest that you do on the dining room table, you put your ODU financial aid package and your UVA financial aid package and your Liberty financial aid package and your Norfolk State financial aid package and figure out how much money you're getting from each college and what the bottom line is you're going to have to pay. I'll be honest, sometimes when you get those financial aid packages, it's a little confusing. So definitely talk to Ms. Saki or your school counselor or someone that knows what they're talking about so we can decipher it for you so you know what you're getting. For example, let's say you apply to Lynchburg College and you get a $20,000 a year scholarship based on your financial aid, financial need. And you're like, oh my gosh, $20,000, that's amazing. And you apply to ODU and you get a $10,000 scholarship uh, per year for financial need. And you're like, well, 20,000 is more than 10,000. I should definitely go to Virginia Wesleyan. Well, remember, ODU is going to only cost you about $25,000 a year. So 25 minus 10, it's going to cost you 15,000. Whereas Lynchburg may cost you $45,000 a year. If you take off that 20,000, you're paying $25,000 a year. So don't get caught up on the amount of the scholarships. You want to get, make sure you're focusing on the bottom line of what it's going to cost you to go to that college per year. And most of all these um, financial aid loans and scholarships are all renewable. So if you get it the first year, as long as you make decent grades, you should get it the, the following year, three years. All right, some final tips to remember. Just make sure when you're applying to scholarships or jobs or colleges, if you're doing anything paper, pencil, always do it in pen. Don't use pencil. If you can do it online and type it, that's much better, and then print it out or submit it. If you're handwriting it, please make sure you're writing neatly. Do not use pencil or colored pencils. Make sure people are reading your essays and your applications to make sure everything's correct and there's no mistakes. Um, if you uh, win a scholarship or you have someone write an, uh, thank you, uh, a recommendation for you, please make sure you write a thank you note to that person. Make sure you understand all the deadlines and requirements before beginning the application and that you convey that information to anyone who is assisting you with it. Um, make sure if you're asking for a recommendation, you ask the person directly. Don't assume that they're going to do it just because you ask. You know, they may be busy. They may um, feel like they can't write a good one for you. So just be open to that as well. I do want to address, and we haven't talked about this yet, the P issue. So if you don't know it already, last semester, if you had a final grade from second semester at Indian River High School or a full year class, maybe it was alternate day it was like a, or a full year class like catering or AP English 11, that you don't think that grade is going to help your GPA or you don't want it on your transcript, you can request that final grade be changed to a P. P means pass. You get a credit for the class um, and you get the honors weight or AP weight if, if that's applicable but the grade is not averaged into your GPA, so it doesn't affect your GPA. So for example, let's say you have a 3.3 GPA and you got a D in chemistry last year, and that's the only really bad grade you had, and it was a second semester class, you can request that D be changed to a P so the D doesn't show up on your transcript and the D is not averaged into your GPA. How do you do that? 
you just have to go to the Indian River High School website on the main page, look for the guidance corner, and there's a line that says, do you want to change a final grade from second semester to a P? If so, click on this Google form, you fill it out, I make the change, it's all good. You have until January of 2021 to request this. Now, we've talked to some colleges and we've said, how do you feel about seeing P's on students' transcripts? And one of the responses we got was, when we see a P, we're assuming that they did not do well in that class. So if the student made an A, B, or maybe even a C, we think maybe the student should just leave that on the transcript because if we see a P, we may assume the worst because we don't know what grade it is. That's what the admissions officers told me. They also said that primarily they're looking to see what classes did you take in high school, what kind of grades you're making, and what your class rank is. Your overall GPA isn't as important. So I'm just saying this, be careful about asking for too many grades to be changed to P's. I've also had some students take B minuses or Bs and be changed to P's because while it would lower their GPA, um, they felt like you know, they didn't want their GPA to be lowered but now they have P's on their transcripts and a college could look at it and go, well, is that a P because it was just a B or is it a P because they just got a D? So my advice is be careful about asking for those P's um, and talk to your school counselor and see what they say. Um, some tips, one tip specifically for parents, um, when my son was going through the college application process, we fought like cats and dogs because this is what happened. I would say to him, hey, JMU's application is due January 1st. It's October 20th. Have you done anything on this? No, not yet. It's not due to the 1st. And then I would just keep asking every single week. And every single week, we would fight about whether he did anything on this application. What I finally realized was JMU's application was January 1st. So what I did was I bumped up the application deadline for me to, let's say, December 15th. So we had an agreement that from October to December 15th, I would not ask him at all about the JMU application. He's on his own to do it. Come December 15th, if it was not done, then he knew I was going to be hounding him for the next two weeks to get it done. There's going to be a lot of um, discussion, arguments, yelling probably about you know deadlines and when things need to be done. So parents, I'm giving you my advice. It's okay to create your own deadlines. Leave it up to your sons and daughters to get it done by your deadline. And then if they don't get it done by that deadline, then you can really um, make sure everybody's uh, doing what they need to do to get it done as quickly as possible. Um, for anybody that's interested in playing sports at the college level, specifically at the Division I or II level, make sure that you register with the NCAA, um, what's called the Eligibility Center. You have to do this. Um, if you are going to play sports in college, they have waived the SAT and ACT requirement for seniors this year. But if you happen to have taken the SAT or ACT and you want your score sent to the Eligibility Center, you need to use the code 9999 if you're going to take the SAT or ACT or if you're going to pay the extra money to get your score sent. The NCAA is like JMU. They will not accept your SAT or ACT score directly from the high school. If you're interested in playing college sports at a Division III school like Virginia Wesleyan, you do not have to register with the Eligibility Center um, because Division III schools do not um, have to be cleared by the NCAA. You just have to meet the admissions requirements for those different colleges. Um, we're just beginning, so if you've done absolutely nothing as of today, it's okay, but by the end of October, early November, you really need to start narrowing that process down of picking your colleges that you're going to apply to. Um, if you go to the Schoology guidance course, it's the pink folder that we created some resources for you. Um, this video will be in there. You can also see there's something called College Application Tips 2020. Um, this goes through all the steps that I talked about tonight, but gives you some more advice that I did not talk about, so I encourage you to read that. Um, you can also see that there's a sample resume, um, and there's some information about life after high school. This was the video we did back in September that talks about if you want to join the military or go into um, your career or you know, community college or four-year college. We just glossed over it really, really quickly, but there are going to be resources there um, that will be added throughout the year. 
All right. Well, obviously you can't ask any questions because we're not live, but I hope you found this um, information helpful. Um, please email your assigned school counselor or Ms. Saki. If they can't help you, you're welcome to email me. I just prefer you go to them first uh, because they're going to be the ones who are going to know you the best. Um, but we wish you the best on this college application process and the scholarship application process. And I hope you take some of the advice um, that we've given you today um, and use it. And if you have more questions, please feel free at any time to get in touch with us. And always check your email and check the Schoology course and the scholarship group as well. So have a great day and best of luck, seniors. We miss seeing you.